Welcome, Igniters. Well, today we're going to have an interesting conversation with Marcus Ogden. But before we delve in deep, why don't we learn a little more about Marcus? Growing up in a single parent home with a father that inspired perseverance and fairness, Marquise Ogden learned how to define his values and set goals. Ogden attended Howard University from 1998 to 2002, where he played Division I football. Ogden then followed his dream and his brother Jonathan's footsteps, eventually getting drafted in the NFL in 2003. Overall, he played for five years as an offensive lineman with the Titans, Bills, Ravens, and Jaguars. Even during the offseason, Ogden helped train football players in Europe, both physically and mentally. Following his NFL career, Ogden started Caden Premier Enterprises, a construction company in 2007, which quickly escalated to a multi-million dollar construction firm. In 2013, it all crashed down around him when Ogden got involved with a bad business deal. He ended up losing everything. Ogden became a speaker to help others succeed where he failed. As a keynote speaker, executive coach, and corporate trainer, his passion is to create value for every client. Ogden's client consists of AXA Advisors, The Home Depot, J.P. Morgan and Chase, to name a few. And now a guest on Ignite Your Essence TV show, Marquise Ogden, welcome. Hello, Marcus. Hi, Michelle. How are you? I'm doing well. So you're you're a busy man. You just came off a podcast. So we're really honored to have you here on Ignite Your Essence. Oh, so, Michelle, it's great. Thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. Well, that's fantastic. Thank you. So it's quite an honor looking at your intro. We really wanted to speak a little deeper as to your journey. Your life could have gone anywhere. And we're talking about how to inspire others to walk in their purpose. Marcus, what was your purpose? Because you could have gone anywhere. Howard University, NFL player, businessman in building, and now you're inspiring others and also companies and their brands. Could you explain to us what your origin story was? How did you find your purpose? That's a great question. So how I found my purpose and what I do today, Michelle, is... When I lost everything in 2013, my construction company went bankrupt as a result of me getting into a bad business deal, along with I had a really big ego. I couldn't be talked to. You couldn't tell me anything. As a result of that, my pride got in the way and it ended up crashing down around, like you mentioned earlier in the intro, where I lost my business. Not just that, but I lost my home, lost my cars, lost all my money, lost my credit, lost friends, family, lost it all. And when I was working in the Raleigh area for Merrill Lynch, I was trying to get my life back together, but it wasn't going well. So I was fired from that job. Then I took a job to a construction company the next day and I was fired from that job five days later. So I was fired from two jobs in the same week. The only job I could get, along with coaching kids football, I became a custodian working the night shift from 10 p.m. until 5 a.m. for $8.25 an hour. Now, I tell everyone, being a custodian, that helped support my family. There was nothing beneath me to take care of my wife and my stepdaughter. And I took the job. But what life had not given me, right, Michelle, was that wake up, was that purpose. Nothing really struck me until I had that spoiled milk rock bottom moment of clarity where somebody's trash, rotten meat, nasty protruding garbage got over my body, my skin, and my clothes. And as a result of that, I ended up putting myself in a position where I realized that accountability and responsibility were missing from my life. And as a result of that, I came home that morning, wrote down my three biggest strengths, and I realized that my purpose was going to be to help others succeed in their life where I failed. And I wanted to share my stories, 
my knowledge, my experience with others so that they could have prosperity, joy, and happiness in their life and learn from my mistakes. Don't feel sorry for me, right, Michelle? Learn from me. And mm -hmm. that is the purpose behind my work today. Well, thank okay. you very much. First of all, for your candor. Not a lot of people want to admit where their breaking point was, or should I say breakthrough point? Uh -huh. Because you have, what's interesting about your story, Marcus, is that it seems your trajectory was up and up and up, but you did have some challenges. Oh, a lot yeah. of times, like the biggest dream for, for a young man to be, to do is to graduate from a top level university. And then you get drafted by, you know, division one uh, teams and, and then you get cut. Now that could have been all you wrote about your life, mm -hmm. but then you reinvented, you mm -hmm. created this business. Mm -hmm. But your candor about your attitude, that attitude that eventually brought you down. Could you speak a little more to how that kind of attitude, because we have a whole culture now that's developing of fake it till you make it. That's what they're telling people. Fake it till you make it. Let everybody know, you know, be the expert, even though you're not there. Could you please speak to the authenticity that's needed to build that confidence rather than fake it till you make it? You know what, Michelle, that's an excellent point. And I feel that social media can be a gift or a curse. And a lot of times people go on social media wanting to talk about how great their life is and how awesome their life is. And they got the Lamborghini or the Bentley and they're flying in this jet or going to this place, going to Vegas, all these things that really don't matter. Right. It doesn't make you a better person because you're flying in a private jet or because you are staying at the penthouse in the Aria. It doesn't mean anything. Right. It doesn't make you better. And what I have learned to live my life by is the law of authenticity, which clearly states the best gift you have to give someone is yourself. Period. Yourself. Don't try to be something you're not. Don't try to fake it. Don't try to be this individual, this man or woman that, you know, you want everybody to like you, to praise you, all these things. That's not important. I have a young lady that I know, and she's on LinkedIn, phenomenal person. She gets so caught up in what others think about her or the group has ostracized me or they don't like me and things like that. And she thought that I didn't like her because I didn't really haven't talked to her lately. I said, well, no, no, anytime I see you post something, I comment, I like, I'm not gonna be, you know, I'm not gonna have my life run or someone to tell me who I can be friends with, who to like, not like, because of being the cool kid. This is not high school, this is real life. So for me, what I find it's important to really just live your life by the law of authenticity and just be who you are. Right. Like me, I've lost it all. I've just had everything stripped from me, home, cars, money, everything taken from me. But it doesn't mean that I'm going to say, oh, I'm this phenomenal speaker today. And I speak for this many companies, and this many companies. And my life has been gravy and easy and just, you know, you know, da, 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 because that's not real. That's not authentic. Like people need to know the challenges you've been through because people go through challenges. Right, Michelle? And they need someone they can look at and try to emulate. Don't be like them, but find someone that can, that can help them push through those hard times. Wow, you really speak to an important point. Uh, well, several that you brought up, but the social media does kind of bring us back to childhood, to like that teenager thing. And people get so wrapped up in what the outside views them. You seem to be a very direct person, Marcus. Mm -hmm. And when you're teaching people how to inspire to walk in their purpose, do you have a method where you just cut right to it and say, hey, we need to find the real you? Because a lot of people don't know who they are. What in your process, how do you get to that core of that individual who truly wants to walk in their purpose? But they don't even know what their purpose is because they don't know who they are. First call I have with every coach and client, Michelle, we go through, tell me your story. Because if I don't know who you are, what you've been through, I can't customize a program to coach you and not give you the best of me. I also live my life by the law of value. You give more in value than you take in payment. 
And that's what I live by. That's why I have a lot of coaching clients. I get a lot of repeat clients. We get a lot of sponsors for our podcast. They repeat because I and our team live by the law of value. Now, with my clients, tell me your story. Then the first thing I do after that, right, Michelle? Now, make sure your audience gets this. I ask them, what are your three biggest strengths? I don't ask them what three things you want to work on. I ask them, what are your three biggest strengths? Because the human mind and a lot of times society programs us to figure about or talk about or try to figure out what we don't do well. Well, you don't do this well, or you don't do that well. Got it. Okay. Got the t-shirt. But what do you do well? Because I want people in the right mind frame where they can think about what value they bring to this coaching session, to their ability to become better, walk in their purpose. So once we figure out what they do well, then we talk about what you want to improve upon. Because once you're in a spirit and a place of like, oh, I do this well, I do that well. Okay, great. Now I want to work on this. But if I go the other way, but what you want to work on, you start thinking about, oh, what am I not good at? What I got to get better at? Then It takes away from the purity of you telling me what you do well because you're so focused on what you don't do well. So that's how I go. It's always an approach. Tell me your story. What three things are your biggest strengths? What do you want to improve upon? And then the three facets of any successful inspirational business. Operational excellence, quality product assessment, and excellent customer experience not customer service customer experience which is from the beginning to the end of the transaction customer service comes in if there's a problem you need to rectify but i love to get great customer experience so again operational excellence quality product assessment excellent customer experience And this, my friends, is why Marcus is sought after by also companies. If you're lucky enough to have him as a coach, you can see we're going to cut right into it and find out what you're about. And also with companies, you're going to be able to really define that whole group, hurt all those kittens, and to find out how to get that full customer experience. Marcus, you talked about those three aspects, those three things that that you're good at. And you mentioned about, we talked about your origin story. You had other people's garbage all over you and you sat down and you sat on the curb and you reassessed. How did you come up with making a list of three things that are good for you? Most of the time people are just, their spirits are so crushed. And I think it's really important that people hear this, especially because of the pandemic. A lot of people feel that they're never going to come back. Can you speak to those listening right now and to show them how you got to this point? So here's the thing. When I was on the curb, crying my eyes out, I realized at that moment, Michelle, that horrible realization that nobody was coming to help me, not a soul, not a person. My grandfather, God rest his soul, said it best. I used to always say, hey, granddad, how you doing today? Oh, Marcus, I'm doing fine, son. That's good. He said, Marcus, if I wasn't doing fine, who would care anyway? And I'm like, oh, Okay, that makes sense. I care. But he said, no, Marcus, you're my grandson. You're supposed to care. But people who don't know me don't care. What he was trying to tell me is everybody has their own problems. And so by you saying, oh, I don't have this, or I don't have that, or complaining about this, people are not going to really listen to you because they're so focused on trying to give what they need to live their life. So once I realized, Michelle, that nobody was coming to save me, I had the hard realization to make at that moment, my life could either go this way for positivity or that way for destruction. I was right at that balance. That spoiled milk moment of clarity was the moment of balance for me. Either I could shift my mindset to be positive and get myself going, or I could just go right down the tube and be negative and live in what I call that victim mode syndrome where everybody you feel is basically should feel sorry for you. And I didn't want to do that. 
So I said, since somebody's coming to save me, that playing victim mode for the rest of my life is going to get me absolutely nowhere. Let's get off the couch. Let's get moving. And let's redefine and realign your purpose. You are really speaking to something that is becoming a trend. There are a lot of people who teach about public speaking and how to pitch and all kinds of ways to reach audiences. And they always tell them you have to have a story that has the hook and the hook should be your victimization. They may not use those words, but they say they have to come from there. And I think people don't realize that, yes, you have to talk about where you're coming from. And sometimes they're not a lot of times they're not pleasant situations. But we have to get through that and in order to lead others. Mm -hmm. You're a leader and you lead others. You lead high executives. You help other athletes. You help anyone who needs purpose, who needs to redefine their purpose, find their purpose, discover their purpose. This is who you are. Now, for those who are watching right now, Marcus, that are saying, OK, this sounds really good but I'm in the middle of something that's really terrible. Do I sit down and write these things? What next? How do we move forward? Do I find somebody? People are in full of chaos. Can you speak to that as to how they can move forward? Because we really want to give people that full experience of how to make that transition. So I'm going to basically tell people the same thing that I had to realize. If you're going through chaos and you're lost and you don't know where to go, Find someone that has gone through loss, that has gone through harsh times, that have gone through difficulties. I tell my clients all the time, and they love this saying, you pay me so you don't end up like me. And I say, I say, I'll say it again. People pay me, right, Michelle, so they don't end up like me. I had a client sign up to uh, last week, has first call today, a real estate investor hired me for the rest of the year. And I said, man, what you've invested in me, by the time you're done, you're going to have a system. You're going to have a process. You're going to know how to look at things, how to analyze things, how to make moves, how not to drag your feet, how to analyze and push forward uh, on the right projects. And you're going to make so much more money than what you paid me because you're going to actually learn what I did wrong in the real estate construction business. Someone that knows him is also a real estate investor. Since hiring me, right, Michelle, he's had a 400% increase in his portfolio in the last 18 to 24 months. Excuse me, you said 400? 400% increase. May I ask how long he's worked with you? In the last 18 to 24 months. Wow. That's how I mean, for about a year and a half, between a year and a half, to two years. And wow. Because I helped. He knew real estate, but he didn't know business and process and systems to set up, create funnels to do what he yes. needs to do. That's the, there's two types of consumers in our world. There's mm -hmm. a visionary consumer. There's an operational consumer. A visionary consumer is someone that's big on blueprint. They're big on overall scheme, vision. They're a CEO type. They're very good at knowing how to do what they need to do. But where they struggle is the operational side of the map, which is process, which is systems, which is implementation strategies, all that. So my client, Abel, was a classic visionary when I met him. He didn't have systems. He didn't have processes. He didn't know how to communicate with people. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, Aristotle said this 3,000 years ago, okay? If you want to succeed at sales, master these five things. Character, emotion, reason, metaphors, be concise. Your character is the epitome of who you are. It's your brand. It's your reputation. It's what people see first when you come through the door, either directly in their face or they feel that are. The next thing is emotion. People need to know that you are able to feel and connect with them. Otherwise, if you can't connect emotionally, they're going to somebody else. Reason. 
What's the logical reason that they should work with you? What's the benefit? What's the ROI? What's the gain? That's important. The fourth one is metaphors. I go to the gym seven days a week. I was working out this morning in my garage because my young daughter was not feeling well. So I didn't go to the gym this morning, but I worked out at home. I did my core, biceps, back, jump rope. While I was doing my workout, Rocky was playing on my phone. Okay, Rocky, been out since the 70s, right? Now we're in 2020. It's a metaphor. It's what I enjoy because I get through my workout knowing that Rocky can get through his fights. That's the metaphor. People love a hero's journey. They love somebody that can go down and come back up. It never gets old. Never, never gets old. And then the last thing is just be concise, Michelle. Consumers don't want to waste their time. So bring those five aspects to the table. And again, recognize there's two types of consumers, visionary and operational. And once you have that, everything else goes straight away. Wow, that is beautiful. Folks, I hope you're taking notes because our, our, our viewers actually do, Marcus. And those five aspects are so important. Metaphors seem to be something it's, uh, you know, I, I have spoken with metaphors with other people, but not a lot of people talk about the importance of metaphors. And the interesting thing about metaphors, and we know in neuroscience, is that if you can work through metaphors in your life, you're actually blending both sides of your brain. You're creating those connections. And where I was going from here, Marcus, is that systems and processes require both parts of the brain. There are visionary leaders, though, too, Marcus, um, that you've come across, and they have these really great ideas and maybe they hit it right where they have a company or they have a process that are um, a program that people are really interested in, but they don't want to pay attention to systems and processes. Could you please speak to those individuals because they put millions of dollars into companies and they go, yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't really want to focus on that. I want to have the hype. I want to have a good marketing crew. Is that an imbalanced way or what do you have to say to them about systems and processes? There's three parts of any successful business, marketing, sales, operations. Plain and simple, marketing is critical. If people don't know you exist, they can never buy your product. It's not possible. So marketing is important. Now, people who say, well, marketing and sales are the same. Well, that's like saying, you know, eating, you know, you know, Burger King is the same as eating, you know, I don't know, you know, McDonald's or Chick-fil-A. It's not the same. It's not even close because sales is converting those leads into dollars for your business. So marketing will kind of like you get to the table. Sales, you have to actually close and be able to get business to be able to eat and grow and convert but operations is going to be the most important part because here's the thing if you good at marketing and you close sales but your operations aren't good your character will go down the tube because nobody is going to want to hire you if the work quality is not good remember what i said earlier quality product assessment. That's operations, that's systems, that's processes. If you don't have that, you're in big trouble because you're not able to execute on what you're doing. And that's why, unfortunately, so many businesses went out of business through COVID because they couldn't operationally execute what sales were coming, right? Or worse yet, they were short staff, which was absolutely heartbreaking, and they couldn't man the, the work that needed to be done. So because of that, so yes, many yeah. people just don't understand. But if you don't have operations, Michelle, mm -hmm. again, your business will fail. It's just not going to it's not going to survive. And that's exactly why Caden went out of business. I broke down and I cracked at the foundation with operations. And that one bad job, along with my really big ego, bigger than King Kong, cost us our business. 
I'm almost speechless here because you're giving it to us straight. You have not only this amazing personality, but you're really giving all this energy to all of our viewers. And I want to thank you so much, Marcus. And I'd like to take a little break, but before, and, and but as we continue from there, I'd like to talk about those learning lessons that you had. You said, you're paying me because I'm going to show you how not to fail through my failures. You're going to succeed or something to that effect. Correct. And I'd like to continue with that. Uh, and so, Marcus, we'll be right back with you. What I'd like to do, though, folks, is I'd like to remind you that we are on the Los Angeles Tribune platform and we are growing. There are amazing things that are happening, as you've noticed on Roku television and all the platforms. But don't take my word for it. I want to show you what the, what the Los Angeles Tribune is up to now in media. Welcome to the Los Angeles Tribune page. Here you will find original news programming, exclusive digital events, and shows that are directly from the community. At the Los Angeles Tribune, we believe in giving a voice to the voiceless. We are proud to be the only national brand to empower everyday people to make a difference. Since 1886, our reputation has been built on truth and responsibility. Thank you for watching and making a difference. For general inquiries, contact today. Thank you on behalf of the Los Angeles Tribune team. And we're back. Welcome to Ignite Your Essence. And you just learned about the Los Angeles Tribune. Been around since the 1800s and we're going strong. Today we have our guest, Marcus Ogden, a businessman that is something of a legend. Now, I want you to make sure if you're just popping in right now, I notice that we're having growing, growing audience. I want you to catch us on the replays because he has broken it down for you as to how to pull yourself out from the bootstraps and to not only make your life successful, but perhaps make your, make your business grow exponentially. And although you can also reach him as a life coach, as you can imagine, he's in high demand. And so he has taken the time and we're so happy to have him here on Los, on Los Angeles Tribune, especially Ignite Your Essence, because he is going to share with us a little more about his journey, not only of the steps that he shared with us, but a little more of his journey of how he learned from his failures. And with that, I'd like to bring on Marcus Ogden again. Marcus, thank you so much for staying with us in between that break here. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to thank you again for really telling us exactly how things are going. We talked about systems and processes. We talked about metaphors. We talked about all the different aspects that we need to do. But more importantly, we want to talk about facing ourselves, facing, facing that dark person inside. Now, you said that you have learned a lot of these aspects in your method and your process through your failures. Could you share with us a couple of those failures that kind of help us to understand how that journey evolved? Yeah. So the biggest failure that I had was I got into a business that I really didn't know. When I left football for about six months, I had some issues with alcoholism, addiction, um, you know, things of that nature, because I just didn't really know what to do. Uh, and I was just lost at a place in my life. And the biggest mistake I ever made was getting into construction and starting that business. And I partnered with the wrong person. And unfortunately for me, the business has success. And because I didn't really understand how I didn't really know the business. And by the time I figured out that my partner really didn't understand it as well as he came across and I knew I didn't know it. It was too far gone and we became this large massive contractor we had all these awards we were winning this making money all this stuff and i was living the highlight but unfortunately because of the lack of intelligence and the ability to understand how to process things i really was putting myself in a position of harm because as the company grew i couldn't control it I couldn't understand how to operate. We talked about this earlier about operations. I operationally lost control of an eight-figure business. And once I lost my best people 
And then in conjunction with that bad job where I spent about two to three million dollars of my money in less than 90 days and the developer denied my change order and the contractor did and the bank shut us off. At that time, Michelle, it was a wrap. So that was a really big failure that I made in my life. I got into something to chase money, fame, notoriety, what I call external motivating factors that mean absolutely nothing. And that's what cost me everything. Thank you very much for sharing that. You know, it's amazing your candor. Honestly, you were saying you you didn't know about the business. Uh, you had an ego about you. A lot of people don't admit that. Um, and and yet here you are, you're actually bare bones. This is Marcus Ogden, folks. I would imagine that if we were at home at dinner with your family, this is what we would get. Is that true? Oh, it's, I'm the same person. Like there's, there is no fluff. There is no me trying to put on a front for interviews exactly. because here's the thing is just why, you know, I, I just, I mean, what's the, why? I mean, you know, if you're going to coach people, right. And help to better people, if you can't be real, right. You got a problem. Another law that I live by, <clears throat> excuse me, it's called the law of influence, which states when you abundantly put others interests before your own, you influence people for the positive and for the better. And so many people today are just so caught up in, well, what do they think about me? Society's going to think this. They're going to think that. Oh, they're going to make fun of me. This, that, yeah. Let me tell you something, ladies and gentlemen. People are going to either make fun of you or talk about you regardless. Regardless. So why not just have it on your conscience knowing that you're real? at all times. You don't have to try to be something you're not. You don't have to try to fake it till you make it. You don't have to try to put on this front. I didn't get a paid speaking job for two and a half years. Two and a half years, not one. Wow. And I kept going. But everybody's like, oh, Marcus, you're so successful now. You speak, you work for 35, Fortune 500 companies and people love you. I'm like, well, yeah. Okay, now... <laughs> you want my life like in 2013, 14, 15, in the beginning of 16, where there was nobody that knew who I was. I got no speaking jobs. I got absolutely zero. Mm -hmm. You want that life? Because if you want the Marcus today, you got to take the Marcus of that time too. A lot of people say, oh, man, nah, I'm good. I'm like, well, yeah, most people say no, thank you. And I would just get tired of the rejection. But here's the thing too. If you're an entrepreneur, you better get used to rejection because it's going to happen. It's going to happen. And if you can't handle rejection, you can't handle life, especially in the business world. And this, folks, is a hero's journey. Marcus, you just laid out what a hero's journey is. It's that rough spot that you have to get through to get where you are today. You mentioned about control. You mentioned about control, and we see this issue a lot with people in business and also their life. They want to control everything. And do you feel that that, that fear of losing control is why people don't want to put in systems and processes in, in their life and their work? Why when their employees or people partnering with them saying, hey, we got to sit down, we got to put things on paper so that we can make sure that everything works well with business. Is this why they don't want to move forward with that? Michelle, you ready for this? It's not about fear of losing control. It's about fear of success. Because here's the thing. When you become successful, you have to be accountable to yourself and responsible to others around you. Like for me, I am accountable to myself, to all that I do for me and for the brand. I'm responsible to my wife, my two daughters, my business partner, my employees, my contractors I work with, because what we do for this brand is how they make money. And a lot of times people are very concerned because Steve Harvey says it best, when you have success, it's going to keep coming and things happen. And one of my favorite songs, and if you're in my age group, you remember this from you know, back with Puff Daddy and B.I.G., more money, more problems. And that's true because you have to take care of 
taxes. You have to take care of setting up systems. You have to take care of paying people. You have to take care of, you know, setting things up. You have to worry about the people like you for your money or for your fame. And so all these things are factors. So are they afraid of losing control? Possibly. But I feel a lot of people, because that used to be me, I'm like, oh my God, like if this actually works out, I'm going to have to like fly around the country and speak and do this and do that. Do I want to do that? Do I want to go ahead and take responsibility, right, to other people? Again, it's an external promise to do what you need to do to help others do what, Michelle? Succeed. So I have, I took on that accountability to be responsible to others when I said I'm going to go with this all the way. And that's why I'm doing a podcast. It'll be nine o'clock tonight when I finish, have dinner with my yes. wife, go to bed, be up at five in the morning, get my wife and daughter to the uh, to school. My wife's a teacher, be at the gym by 530, lift, do what I got to do, be back home by eight for my first coaching call with my client. That's the, that is the responsibility that I promised to people. For example, I remember I was, I went to Austin, Texas last week for a speaking job. Got home at 1.30 in the morning because the flight was a couple hours delayed. Woke up at 5, helped my wife and daughter to school, got to my boxing training session at 6 a.m., did that, was home by 7.30, had a phone call with one of my clients to start my day on Friday. And I got home at 1.30 in the morning that same morning. Worked out, do what I have to do with my trainer, got home, showered. I was on the phone from 7.30 until 6 p.m. on Friday after getting no, no more than four hours sleep, about three and a half hours of sleep. That is what people are afraid of. They're afraid if I actually do this and it works, man, I got to be responsible and accountable. And sometimes people don't want to do that. Wow. You're so right. When you broke it down like that, it is, it is a fear of success. You brought up something that's really interesting though, because people think about the trappings of success as the money, the notoriety, the fact that people know who you are and that you are an expert at whatever that is, X, Y, Z. But what you're showing everyone is that with that comes the trappings of responsibility. So success to you, could you define uh, to the audience what you feel success is? Success is in the eye of the beholder. It is what you want to achieve. Is that more money? Is that more freedom? Is that more time with your family? There is no universal definition of success, right? It's what you make of it. But I will tell you this, ladies and gentlemen, if you don't handle success, success will handle you. Plain and simple. I was not prepared for the success of Caden. I wasn't prepared to be 30 years old with an eight-figure, $15 million a year business. I wasn't ready for that. I wasn't counting on that. I wasn't planning that. But so many people just threw jobs and threw money at us. And I was like, yep, I'll take it. I'll take it. And I literally was doing work. I was underfunded, undermanned, but I was just so focused on the wrong things. So success came through money and fame and the right. But again, like I said, external factors that didn't really mean anything. And because I didn't handle success, I wasn't prepared. I didn't appreciate it. I didn't value it. God giveth, God taketh away. And he took it away and I crashed and I burnt hard because I wasn't prepared. So success is in the eye of the beholder. But again, if you don't handle success, success will definitely handle you. That is amazing because how you broke it down with what happened with you, I, I can see in my own life, different aspects of, of seeing that where there were times where I wasn't prepared for success and I've seen other people that weren't prepared for success. This is an interesting concept because a lot of people, like you said, they have different definitions as to what success is. But regardless of that, there is that responsibility.
And that's that value. You talked about taking a bunch of, of jobs of construction and knowing that you were underfunded and you didn't have as many employees to follow through, but the money was too good, right? People are just throwing things at you. Did you have any feedback? Were people telling you that were key uh, people in your business or did you just kind of move forward? You mentioned about an ego, but I think this is really interesting that our listeners would, our viewers would like to hear about because there are times when people do speak up. Did you have that? Great question. Yes. One of my, not one of, excuse me, my best employee, his name was Colin, tried to tell me, Marcus, if we don't watch out for what's going on on this project for uh, for Turner Construction, we are going to be in trouble. We cannot man all of our other projects and man this one with the amount of money going out the door if we keep this up. And I remember this was on a Friday. I said, Colin, don't worry about it. We're good. It's all gravy. We have money in the bank. We have a new bank line. You're overreacting. Go home, spend time with your family, have a great weekend, sleep it off, see you on Monday. He came in on Monday. He handed me his two-week resignation papers. And I said, Colin, what is this? He said, Marcus, you know, my friend, I have a lot of respect for you, but you're not listening to me. You're not hearing me. And great leaders are active listeners. They listen to understand. They don't listen to respond. And I would listen, it'd be one in one ear, out the other. I would always respond. And so I have an acronym for ego, exaggerated, glorified opinions. I always exaggerated, Michelle, how great I was at construction, how great we were. I was always chasing glory to be that in the name in the paper and all this other stuff. And I always had to have the last word. Yeah, 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 Colin, that makes sense. But yeah, 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 yeah. But it was always me having the last word. So he came in and he resigned and he was gone. And like he predicted, three months later, pow, bankrupt, gone. Whew, and I was completely out of business, just like he predicted. So he tried to talk to me, Michelle, but I didn't listen. Once again, another lesson that Marcus can teach us about how to move forward on this. Listening is really important. As you said, leaders listen, not to respond. What? I think that's really important. I wanted to accentuate that, folks, because that is something that's extremely valuable. And if you're paying attention, if you just joined in on this, make sure you catch in the replay. Through this entire interview, you will find that Marcus had listened. He didn't respond right away. And he brought the value. These are all the different aspects that he has been telling you that he does. Now, you did play for the NFL. Were there any lessons? Everybody always wants to ask this. Were there lessons that you learned being a professional football player as an offensive lineman that you took into your business now, today? Or was it all the failures that really evolved as to who you were? Well, it's a little bit of both, but I learned a great lesson from Jack Del Rio, who was my rookie head coach. It was actually his rookie year as a head coach in the NFL as well. Best thing he ever told, not just me, but our entire draft class in 2003 with the Jaguars. If you want to succeed in life, he told us, you have to be your own CEO. Plain and simple. You have to be your own chief executive officer. You have to, again, be consistent, be disciplined, be focused. Like he told us, you work for the Jaguars. Absolutely. But I can't tell you to show up to work at a certain time. I can't tell you to stay late. I can't tell you to go out into the community and talk to people and build a solid conduit, a solid relationship between you as a player and the Jaguar community. I can't do that. But if you're your own CEO, you can tell yourself that. You can bring that energy, that passion. That's why everything I do, when I coach people, when I speak, when I do podcasts, I'm energetic, I'm light, which is why I'm so tired usually at the end of the day. 
because I just don't, you know, sit there with my clients and sit back on the law. One of the best ways to have a strong, unbreakable mindset is great physiology, great energy, moving, controlling your focus. But physiology has been proven to get you fired up, amped up to be successful. So that's what I do every single day. But that's something in that regard that I bring uh, to this whole process. So that's something that I feel a lot of people can start doing to have success in their own right. You were very unique in that respect because a lot of times there's a lot of leaders out there and a lot of consultants, a lot of keynote speakers, a lot of coaches, and they'll tell people, wake up early, wake up at this time, be disciplined. Not a lot of emphasis on your physicality, not a lot of emphasis on training your body. And yet you're saying that this is also a huge component. You also said it was about the metaphor. Now, the metaphor you mentioned about listening to Rocky when you're working out, mm -hmm. but is the body a metaphor to you as well when you're oh. working with your clients? Oh, absolutely. Nathaniel, I see he's right now watching and tuning in. He texted me during the break. I've been coaching Nathaniel now for about two to two and a half years. And Nathaniel has grown astronomically in his brand as a speaker, as a coach, as a consultant, because I told Nathaniel the best gift he has to offer than himself is his experience that he's gone through in business and things like that. But Nathaniel's like me. We are both very big on taking care of our body, on the health and wellness, because here's the thing. If I'm going to coach someone, or I'm going to go up and speak on stage and I don't look like I take care of myself or I value my personal appearance and what I bring to the craft, what I call the indirect tangibles. You've got the direct tangibles is like the speaking, well-spoken, educated, engaging, great stage presence. But the indirect intangible, I feel this the biggest one is how you look, Right. You, do you look like you take care of yourself? Do you take care of your physical appearance? Do you take care of your health? I get haircuts every week. I'm at the gym every day because if I'm going to go out there and try to help people, I have to help myself. Again, it goes back to accountability and responsibility. If there's no accountability, Michelle, there's no responsibility. So if you're not accountable to yourself as a coach, speaker, consultant, there's no way you could be responsible to your client base. It's just not possible because you don't even care about your own merit, about your own process, about your own brand. So if you don't care about your brand, why the hell would you care about mine? <laughs> you do not raise hypocrites. I'll tell you that. So it's interesting about all of the, these aspects. And thank you for bringing up Nathaniel, because um, he was in an interview that a lot of people were contacting us. And they were like, wow, this man is amazing. And this is why it was, it was such an honor to also have you, because like attracts like. And that's what you're describing. You understood the importance of the physicality, where that image is. The interesting thing also is the fact that we know that change, people talk about changing habits and used to be people used to think, oh, it happened in two weeks. And then all these programs of 21 days, uh, Oxford University did a re did research saying actually to get one habit to change, it takes about 67 days. Now we're thinking it takes longer. What can a person get from you in the first three months that you usually see in all of the people across the board? Well, here's what happens. In the first three months, I get to know who you are, what you want to work on, what you need to improve upon, and I give you a lot of baseline foundational things to help you transition. Everyone that comes to me wants something better for themselves. Nathaniel wanted a better life doing more speaking jobs. Great speaker, great story, but he wanted to upgrade his story. People want to help with how to become better business owners, how to become better at creating a podcast, whatever it is. Change is external conditions that you can do nothing about for the most part. For example, no one could do anything about this crazy, non-necessary, horrific war in Russia, oh, excuse me, in Ukraine that's being brought on by Russia and Putin. Nobody can do anything about that other than Putin. 
But the change, we can't do anything about it. Inflation's gone up. Prices have gone up. Transportation, logistics, all these things, right? Michelle, we can do nothing about that. All I can do, all we can do is pray for Ukraine, pray for safety, and pray for peace. It's all we can do. But transition, how we internally adapt to the change, that's what I help my clients do. That's the ROI. That's the law of value. Because you can do nothing about the external factors going on in the world, in your city, in your area, at your job, at your business. You can do nothing about that. But how you transition and deal with the change, that you can do something about. And that's what I work with my clients on, how to transition them through a problem, an issue. There's always a solution. Great quote, uh, 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 one of the, uh, a great quote, it talks about that an optimist finds the solutions in the difficult times. A pessimist finds the difficulty in easy solutions, Winston Churchill. So if you're going to work with me, you're going to get coached and taught about you, how great you are, what you need to work on. We'll build a foundation, but I'm going to help you transition through a hard time because change you can do nothing about, but transition you can do something about. Diamonds. Those are complete diamonds because so many people miss that. And thank you. Thank you for bringing that up because we cannot, we cannot change those exterior factors changing ourselves. And a lot of people feel that it's really a daunting task, but you're breaking it down for us. And this is an amazing process that you have here with the way you coach with people. You really take it real with everyone. I think that this is really extraordinary. And it's probably time, Marcus, every guest that's here on Ignite Your Essence answers a question. We call it the big question. I want to bring that up if you don't mind. And I'd like you Please. to give us your opinion. So the big question is, how do we make the world work for 100% of humanity in the shortest possible time to spontaneous cooperation without ecological damage or dis? advantage to anyone. And that's by our book, Mr. Fuller. Could you please give us your answer? Michelle, it's really simple. Just be kind to everyone you meet. Plain and simple. Don't look at what somebody has or doesn't have or where they're from or what is their ethnicity? What is their gender? What is their political position? What is their income? What is their family life like? It doesn't matter. Just be kind to every person that you meet. If you did that across the board, it doesn't take any type of you know, ecological you know, process. It's going to give a, everyone an advantage to everyone by just being kind. And it's simple. One of the biggest ways to bring about change in our world is make things simplistic for people, right? The simpler it is, the more people can actually adapt and go through this process. But again, just be kind to everyone you meet, regardless of their economic position, their social status, their ethnicity, you know, where they come from, you know, all that stuff, because it doesn't matter, right? I'm kind to everyone that I meet. And if you aren't kind to me, then what I do is I say, thank you very much for showing me who you are. And I just move on. I don't try to live my life with revenge or be, you know, spiteful. Because here's the thing, it takes energy for me to be spiteful or hate training. I don't yes. have time for that. Like I don't have time. My life is too busy. I'm a family man. I've got things to do. I'd rather watch reality TV with my wife than sit there and argue with somebody or some real just you know that I know that you know they're just spiteful and hateful. I'm like, okay, that's fine. And this is what I tell everybody. This is gonna sound interesting, but here's my whole thing. Like, okay. you know, so I talk about like let's take let, let's take people who are like racist, right? Let's take the let's take the Ku Klux Klan. The clan, they're going to be who they're going to be, right? I, if I know you, that's who you are, hey, look, 
look, you do you, right? Do I think what you're doing is wrong and crazy? Absolutely, I do. How are you going to hate somebody because of their skin color or their gender or their religion? That's just stupid to me. But I'm not going to sit there and try to argue with somebody that I know, Michelle, no matter what I say, they're not going to hear me anyway. They're not. So I'm just going to say, you know what? That's who you are. I don't agree with you. I'll never be like you. You go your way. I'll go mine. And that's how I live my life. I mean, I really, the people say, oh, Marcus, you know, you're in the South, man. Is there clan down there? Like, I don't know. Probably. <laughs> you're not know. hanging out with them. <laughs> you're not paying I'm attention. Not looking for them. <laughs> but this is that I know who they are. They go their way. I go mine. I'm not looking to like sit there and like do hate. I mean, because like it takes energy from me and time has no prejudice. It keeps going no matter what. It has no prejudice. If you're man, if you're woman, if you're ethnicity, if you're Asian, if you're black, time doesn't give a crap. It's going to keep going, keep going. So why would I waste something that I know has no prejudice that I know is going to keep going off somebody else because they don't like me. Fine. Don't like me. I'll go this way and keep living my life. Like that's just how I live my life. I love how you shake that off. Now it's not about money for you. It's not about uh, glory for you. You're solving, you're finding solutions for people. You're helping them move forward. You watch reality TV with your wife. I want to talk about that too, but what is it? Am I getting too personal, Marcus, when I ask, what is it? What is what is your goal in life? What is your your big passion? What do you know is your purpose? That's a great question. You're not getting too personal at all. My main purpose is when I leave this earth, that I've left it a better place and gave it all that I could to help others. That's it. When I stopped chasing money and I started pursuing value to people, that's when money caught up. Listen to this, ladies and gentlemen. Imagine it like this. You have two legs. Money has four. Okay? If you chase money, it'll run away from you as fast as you can imagine. If you actually just do life and do correct and bring value to people and just walk down the path, money will chase you and it will catch you every single time. So I've realized that money and all that stuff, I don't chase it. I don't go after it. Because again, that's how I look at money. It's got four legs. I've got two. If I chase it, I pursue it like I did starting my career, I got zero. I got nothing. It always ran away from me. Today, I chase helping people, bringing people value. And because of that, money has caught me. And I'm able to now provide a lifestyle for my family, and for people that I know, because I'm able to really bring the value to people. And that's what money and everything else respects. Value to others, and it will bestow it upon to you. I, I love that. Money has no prejudice. Also, time has no prejudice. Money has four legs. <laughs> it's something very Zen, what you're talking about, because, uh, you know, the Zen Buddhists will talk about if you're grasping at things in your mind, it goes away from you. And if you just stay still or you still, you know, do your thing, things come to you. Obviously, I'm paraphrasing. That's I want to say one thing real quick. You brought this sure. up. OK. In life, don't stress about the future. Thank you, Michelle. You just said it. You can't change yesterday. The future's not here yet. Focus on the now. If you live by this process that you don't move through time, that time moves through you, you're going to live a very, very healthy, happy life. When I stopped focusing on things that were weeks ahead or months ahead, and it's like, you know, I said, oh, you know what? I'm going to focus on today. I can't change yesterday. I can't live for tomorrow because it's not here yet. Today is here and now. Crush today. Then when the future comes towards you, the future is in a better place, a better position for you to execute. But if you're focusing so much on the future, future events, 
A lot of times, Michelle, you screw up the present. And when you screw up the present, the future gets it gets shook up and screwed up as well. I so love that. Stop, like stop focusing on the future and things I can't control. I live my life in the present. I walk down my path. The future will come to me. So you don't move through time. Time moves through you. Yes. Oh, I love it. Okay. I want to take a pause there because folks, diamonds, I'm saying you're dropping here. Marcus, thank you so much. Before we end though, I want to talk about reality TV. Um, have you been watching on Netflix, Love is Blind? Have you yes. guys been watching that? Yes. Yep. Oh my gosh. I just finished the last, uh, the, the last, the second season of the American version. And I watched the Japanese version. I saw the cultural differences in people so much and how some people really want to be real. Some people don't, but I saw the gender changes, um, in the American group, uh, the, the guys were kind of like, you know, kind of supporting each other. The women are kind of supporting each other, but very, very adversarial it seemed. And then the Japanese crew, um, they, they were very supportive of each other, even though they were vying for some of the similar people. What do you get from reality TV shows like this? I mean, um, because I, I enjoy some of it, but I want to hear from you because you have a lot of time and you're spending time with your wife watching reality TV. Could you share with us why that passion? You know what I get? I get time with my wife and that is what is most important to me. I don't really care what we watch. She likes to watch Euphoria. I, I, I'll watch it. You know, I'm not big on it. You know, I'll try. But 90 Day Fiance, Love is Blind. And I used to even watch with her, like a lot of the housewives, you know, Orange County or Atlanta or Dallas or, you know, all this stuff. I mean, I wouldn't watch, you know, Potomac. I wasn't watching stuff, you know, before that. You know, I'm a, I'm a, that's not what I was doing. You know what I mean? I was watching like old 80s Conan movies because that's just who I am. But my wife is the main thing that I get from reality TV. It's time with her. It's the quality time. And it's her knowing that I am willing to change and adapt and evolve as she does. And I put our marriage and our time together as a priority. And that's what I get out of reality TV. You know, that's so funny. That's a similarity with my, my own wife. We've been together for 25 years and I never watched reality TV, but I love spending time with her. And yeah. it's like, it's like, you know, you're not looking at the clock. It's quality time, your passion. You're an amazing father, an amazing coach, an amazing husband, a real person, and such an honor to have you and ignite your essence. Marcus, our goal here, as I mentioned before, um, when we were offline here, is to be inspirational, educational and experiential and you hit every one of those points and for that we want to thank you so much it's such an honor to have you here i hope you will honor us again at some point at night your essence because there's so much that we want to amplify with you because that is our goal amplify the good in all so we can move forward and propel ourselves to help humanity and the planet. And Marcus, thank you so much. And with that, folks, I want to tell you once again, I want to thank you for spending this time. I can't believe how all of our listeners, our watchers have definitely have been watching and they're so excited. Marcus, I don't know if you noticed, we had so many comments and there's so much gratitude and there's so much value that you brought. That is one of your focuses in life and you brought it for us. And I really, on the bottom, just for the team, Ignite Your Essence, and for myself, I want to thank you so much for bringing yourself and really showing up. And I want to remind all of you who are watching that as you're, as you're listening and taking notes and you're finding this transition in your life feeling hard, check out people like Marcus, check out people like Nathaniel, listen, learn and change because I'm telling you, things do get better. And Marcus has shared with you his vulnerabilities in his life and how that's been. And I want to remind you to always find a reason to smile. And with that, I want to close with you, Marcus, could you please give us a closing remark for all of our audience so that they can remember even more so why you were so amazing? One of my favorite quotes by Aristotle, in times of extreme darkness, focus on the light. The light is, and I really believe Aristotle meant this, the light is inside of you. You are the eternal flame 
And as long as you have an unbreakable mindset, which you can form again with great physiology, controlling your mental focus and believing at your core that you deserve to succeed, everything will take care of itself. But again, if times get hard, which it does, if times get stressful, which we all know that happens too, focus on the light. You are the light. And like Aristotle said, bring that whole process, bring that whole you know gamut of believing in yourself and never giving up. And no matter what you go through, you can always achieve success. Thank you everybody for the great comments and all the kindness and kind words. I really appreciate it. And um, I enjoyed this hour and uh, yeah, thanks for having me on. I really appreciate it. The honor is ours. Thank you and Marcus and see you later, everybody. Bye. <laughs> 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 <laughs>